It gives me great pleasure to introduce our last speaker in the series for uh, Defining Cognitive Science this season. Of course, it was Women in Cognitive Science. Um, the topic today is Affective uh, communication through touch, and our speaker is Karen McLean. She is a professor in computing science from UBC, and her background includes mechatronics, robotics, um, physiolo physiology, <laughs> excuse me, and sensory uh, psychophysics. Um, I'm going to let her introduce a little bit more about her background because she has had a very interesting path um, coming here, and um, and we'll wrap up at the end with lots of uh, time for questions. So, uh, Karen. Nice to be here. I haven't been on the SFU Burnaby campus for quite a while, and I was shocked to see this whole complex over there with a grocery store and everything. It looks totally different. So uh, I've been at UBC for about 11 years now, and I came over from, uh, I was working in the Bay Area at a, at a, a research think tank, a Paul Allen startup company, and where, where we were working on a lot of different kinds of technology. I'll back up before that. I actually did my my major, my undergraduate major in, uh, in biology. I was going to be a doctor. Can I get a sense of who's in the room? So who's an undergrad? Any undergrads? Wow, that's great. And graduate students? A couple? And which department? Okay, and then what departments are you guys from? CS? Computer science. Computer science? You guys are COGS, COGS program? And you guys are? Philosophy. Philosophy. Oh boy. The bar just went way up high. Um, <laughs> and, and what other departments are represented in here? You guys look like grown-ups there. Psychology. Psychology. <laughs> and education. Wonderful. And, and you guys are? Cogs. Cogs. OK, wonderful. So um, I guess the moral of the short story, since Shamin has asked me to tell a little bit about the, the complicated path that got to me to where I am, is that um, it's possible to delay decision making about your career for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> so even though you're, you know, early on in your program or late in your program, you're a grad student, you can still totally reboot, and it might be okay. Um, so, so I started out wanting to be a doctor, um, and I was at Stanford University four years into a pre-med major. I'd fulfilled all the requirements, and suddenly I woke up one day. Actually, someone asked me a question and said, why do you want to be a doctor? And I couldn't answer, because I'd made up my mind when I was 12 years old. I never thought about it since. <laughs> and I thought... Gosh, why do I want to be a doctor? And, and I thought, well, actually, I like, I like the idea of being a doctor, but I really like to build things. And I think as a doctor, I won't get to do that. So I decided to go and uh, get a degree in mechanical engineering, too. So I stayed an extra year, and I got a degree in mechanical engineering. And, but I also remember I had my pre-med degree, and I really loved the biology and understanding how your muscles work and your nerves work and things like that. So I went to MIT, and I got my master's in robotic control which is a little bit different than being a doctor, but I actually used a lot of what I knew because I was in a biomedical engineering group. And then I went and worked and built robots for a couple of years in a company. And then I decided I needed to go back and get a PhD because I wanted to have more control over the kind of research that I did. I didn't want to be working on projects that everyone else had dreamed up. I wanted to dream up my own projects. And I decided that was a worthwhile reason to go back for a PhD, so I went back to MIT and I got my PhD in also in mechanical engineering, and my supervisor said, you know, there's this new thing called haptics. No one really knows what it is. Actually, he didn't say haptics. He said, he said using robots to touch. We didn't have a word for it, really. And so, so I think this would be really cool. Do you want to work on it? I don't know anything about it. And I said, OK, because <laughs> it involved robots and bodies, and that was neat. But no one, this was, this was in the, uh, when was this? This was in like 1990. And really no one was doing any research in this area. There's work happening in uh, robotics that was starting to get at it. People were using robots to do sensory studies and try and figure out how your body works, basically how your reflexes and how your motor control system works. And people were doing some really neat work with uh, just starting to think about tactile displays and, you know, could you do better than a braille display? But that was about it. And so, it was really fun and really hard because no one had thought about what it sh what, what, what should be this as an engineer, what should be the specifications of a haptic display? Um, what should we call them? <laughs> the word haptic started to get to be used in the engineering world not till towards the end of my thesis uh, work there. And so, so it was this delightful and very um, sometimes frustrating and scary process of sort of trying to do something that people weren't doing before. And it was also exciting because I was in at the very, very start, in fact, 
Fast forwarding to 2012, next year, I am chairing the 20th anniversary conference of the Haptic Symposium. The first one was in 1992 when I was a grad student and one of my um, fellow grad students had graduated and then started the very first one. And so since then, a lot has happened. And I want to um, tell you, oh, so, so I didn't finish the story. So, I, so, so then I left MIT and I was a hardcore engineer. Okay, I was an MIT mechanical engineer and I had been taught that it is unseemly to um, like do art. <laughs> that is very not cool for an MIT mechanical engineer to do that kind of thing. And, and, you, and, and we don't talk about that kind of thing there. And so, and so then I, I got hired into this, this think tank and it was full of, guess what, artists and videographers and ethnographers doing all these cookie weird things. And I thought it was so much fun. And within two months, I was doing a, a visiting. I spent six months at the Royal College of Arts in London working on a really wacky project. And I was changed forever. So I spent there four years. And then I was asked to interview when uh, someone found out my boyfriend was at UBC. They said, um, maybe this is a hiring opportunity. They asked me to interview in computer science. And I said, are you serious? I've never taken a computer science course before. And they said, yeah, we're serious. I said, OK. So I went up and interviewed, and they said, we would like you to start our HCI program. Who knows what HCI is? Everyone? Good. I didn't. <laughs> now, that was an awkward moment. <laughs> I said, what, what, what do you mean by HCI exactly? <laughs> so, and, but they did hire me to start their HCI program, so I must have come up with a good answer or recovered somehow. But what I learned was that uh, HCI is about design, human-centered design. And actually, it has a lot in common with what we, co goes by different names in other disciplines. There's um, human-centered design happens in engineering and product design. Stanford has a wonderful program in it. And really, a lot of what I had been doing all through that complicated path, even when I was designing robots in the University of Utah, I was doing human-centered design, but we had different words for it. So I had to do a huge translation when I went to UBC and I was teaching, okay, this is the computer science-y whatever HCI version of design. But the principles, the, the basic core values of doing it are very similar. And so one of the adventures that I've got to do professionally is sort of go from the haptics community, which was very dominated by robotics engineers who don't talk about that art stuff, um, to trying to take that community, because I'm from that community, over to understanding the ethics of interaction design and creativity and delight in the kinds of um, interfaces we have and how to design not just good machines, but good interfaces. And this has been um, sometimes frustrating, <laughs> but, but ultimately I think we're really getting somewhere with it and I'll come back to that at the very, the very end. So I'm gonna talk about physical interfaces or um, I think I actually gave a different title to Shamini originally about affective interfaces and I will talk about um, kind of bringing emotion into design and the, and the sense of touch and talk about some of the things we're doing along those lines. So you know what haptic is, it's your sense of touch. It used to be that people didn't know what the sense of touch was or what that word is. When I gave job talks when I was a PhD student, I remember some old guy in the back row at Johns Hopkins University says, young lady, is that some kind of liver disease? <laughs> and I had to explain that, no, it's not. It's, it's what you feel in your hand. It's how you know where your body is in space. It's your proprioception, which tells you where, where you are and how much weight you're holding and how hard you're pushing on something. And also your, your tactile sense, which is in your skin. So it's, it's vibrations and texture and heat and all kinds of things, and, and uh, we won't go too much into the, the niceties of that. What I'm talking about, we use both, so we'll just, in the engineering community particularly, we use haptic to refer to both proprioception and tactile, whereas psychophysicists tend to use haptic to describe proprioception, but we're going to gloss over that right now. So, touching in the real world is really cool. Uh, actually, people are doing it a lot less than they used to, because now we have, a lot of uh, keyboards and things. But this, these are, I just want to comment on some of the wonderful things we can get out of real touch, real world touch, touching real things. There's um, expressive instruments. Who plays a musical instrument? Who plays a wind instrument? Okay, string? <laughs> I've seen people keep raising their hands. <laughs> um, uh, uh, let's see, have a percussion, a drum or something. 
You got a drummer there too. You're multi to own you as well. Okay, so all of those who ha who answered there, um, what would you do if your hands were numb? How well would it work? Ever tried that or been in a situation like that? Yes, you're nodding. <laughs> Wearing gloves. Imagine playing your instrument with gloves. Um, most of the time, it turns out that, for example, if you're playing the piano and you're a skilled piano, pianist or you're playing something you know very well and you numb your hands, you actually can still play pretty well. Your feed-forward program works, works quite well. But if you're playing for the first time, if you're playing, trying to play a very expressive kind of thing or if you're maybe not so skilled, trying to play without the sense of touch is basically going to... Uh, not sound very good, not not be very not be very expressive either or satisfying to you. So we're getting tons of information through our hands, through the vibrations, through your mouth. If you're using a wind instrument, a clarinet or an oboe, you, I played the oboe a little bit, and you get a lot of vibration through your mouth to control. And you and and the sense of touch is all really crucial to being able to do that. Um, doing fine skilled tasks, motor tasks, there'd be a lot of blood in that picture if that person's hands were numb. Okay. Uh, communication, emotion through touch, so interpersonal, emotional communication, being able to just enjoy the variety of stuff, what stuff feels like, and uh, just the aesthetics. This is uh, kind of getting more into the designy thing. You know, a doorknob. Everyone who's ever taken an HCI course knows that doorknobs. You know, they have affordances. You know that you're supposed to turn them with a hand. You know, they 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 signal all this stuff to you. What about the design of it? This came up in a project that I did uh, with a friend where we were thinking about doorknobs, and we actually walked all over San Francisco taking pictures of doors, because we thought San Francisco has really neat doorknobs. <laughs> if you ever try that experiment. And I have this great collage that has like a hundred doorknobs on it. And this is my personal favorite of all of them. And so a really good doorknob tells you something about the place, right? It tells you something about who lives there, what kind of house it is. It invites you or forbids you from touching it, depending on how it's designed. And in this case, it's very beautiful. And it's, even though it's metallic, it looks warm and welcoming. And so What's about that about a doorknob? That's kind of interesting. So those inspire me. Of course, this is kind of what we got now. We're now graduating to touch interfaces, which means you can slide your finger all across a grass, glass screen, which is um, interesting in a way. It's a huge step backwards on tactile feedback, but has potential of being a big step forward. And we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later. So what's a force feedback device? I think that probably this group knows basically what it is on the motorized side, which is uh, in some ways simpler to explain conceptually. You have, this is a knob, that's supposed to be a circle, turn it on a shaft, and the basic idea is you have a motor that controls a knob and you're also sensing the position or the force or something about how it's being touched, running that through a program in a virtual model and actually um, displaying forces accordingly. And so that's where the robot controls come in, that actually making this thing stable and display interesting things is not totally simple. Um, and of course, a knob is the simplest kind of thing, and you can make very big, complicated ones. For example, when I worked as a robotics engineer at the University of Utah, this was one of the robots I worked on. It's a man, we call a man magnifying system, or a, a telerobot, so basically, Dwight there is wearing an exoskeleton, so he's wearing something on his body, and this is the big one, and he's wearing a force-reflecting exoskeleton, which means that there's actuators in the thing that's on him, and when this thing bumps into something, he feels the bump on his arm. Okay, notice chain-link fence. Okay, big heavy plastic screen, which you can't really see. This is a hydraulic system, and if it loses control, you want that thing there, because this thing could kill you. All right, it's designed to go on the bottom of the ocean and, and pick stuff up. And this is uh, 15 years ago technology, but they it actually I saw a recent version. It doesn't look so different. It, it works differently, but it doesn't look so differently. And uh, furthermore, the exoskeleton that Dwight there is wearing um, could break his arm. Okay, he's wearing a gigantic kill button on his chest, which he can slap if he gets nervous about anything, and he has slapped it before. Because in an early version of it, we discovered there was what we call a singularity in it, which meant that it could actually drive your arm into a place your arm is not supposed to go. So we uh, did a revision on that one. But anyway, so that's one kind of robot, and I thought those were really cool, but I decided I didn't really want to work on those. I wanted to work on things that didn't have to be kept behind a chain-link fence. 
or you have to wear a big kill button on them. I wanted to work on interfaces that people could actually use. So here we go the opposite direction. And here's a, this is a starting to be a little bit dated, but these are some um, kind of the level at which force feedback has gotten to the public, mostly gaming devices and so forth. And this is um, a, a really sad, uh, sad, sad early example of what we imagine haptic feedback could be like. Basically, they vibrate. And we can do so much more than vibration. But the technology is much harder to advance than, than uh, what you would find in graphics, where you see these just tremendous things. <laughs> Haptic, the, the robot technology doesn't follow Moore's law, put it that way. So it's, it's a slower curve. So here's some stuff that's happening in my lab right now that I want to touch on some of this. We, talk, we do haptic communication. We talk about different ways we explore and study different ways that through the sense of touch, you can communicate information. It might be kind of data, it might be emotion, uh, it might be, uh, there's some stuff we're doing also now on implicit control, which is starting to get away from haptics, but is still in the, in the zone there. And we build technology or work with collaborators who are building innovative technology that is trying to push the envelope on, on what we can actually do with it. But the biggest thing I do is interaction design and trying to, to solve problems that people have that might, that might work better if you use a sense of touch. So the current state is that actually the technology is still pretty crude. Uh, to, to what, what you can buy in the store, it we're a little bit better than what you can buy in the store, but it's a long ways to be uh, similar to the realism and the quality and the, and the flexibility and speed that you have with graphics hardware and auditory hardware. And so where the research, the interesting research is happening, in, both in the technology, probably one of the most important things, but also uh, our understanding of haptics perception. We need to understand how people perceive the haptics and also how their motor system works and can respond to it. So it's not just um, sensory psychology, but it's also how, how re reflexes work and what kinds of support and training, for example, could work best. And then, and this is the part that's really been hard to push this agenda in the community, is human-centered interaction design. Because the robot designers will say, like, say I'm, I'm doing application design, and what they mean by that is that they have uh, a use in mind. Like that there is some application that they imagine their technology might work for. But in terms of actually designing from the ground up, studying people, understanding what their problems are, and then trying to fit the technology into a way that would, would solve their problem, that's something that engineers often don't find a natural way to think. Uh, some of the most brilliant engineering advances happen because someone just had a really cool idea. Wouldn't it be neat if you could build this? But when you're actually trying to get technology out into the public and have people being able to use it, you have to start from the problems that people have. And so ubiquitous haptics, haptics is out in the world, is uh, what turns me on. And so I'll give you some examples. So I spent a lot of my early years at UBC uh, probably the first five or six years, trying to solve some questions that came up towards the end of the time I was in industry. And we'd done some application design and we realized we needed to more, know more basics about how people, how, how people can perceive the information that you give to them through haptics. So if you encode information in a haptic signal, how, how, how well can people do it understanding that? And so I spent several years really trying to push that as far as I could. And it went quite a bit further than I expected it would go. So uh, in 2003, sorry, I was the first publication in, in this area, and we defined haptic icons, say <coughs> little informative bits of information that, that have, have inf information encoded in them. And so you could use them for all these kinds of things. You know, your cell phone could actually, instead of just buzzing, it actually has an informative buzz that you could figure out what it means displayed to a user through force or tactile feedback. These days, tactile is just a lot easier to uh, design. They could be embedded. They could be potentially non-intrusive. No one else has to see your thing buzzing. You could, you could uh, think of all kinds of scenarios where that is handy. And lots of different kinds of information might be useful. But if you're trying to do this, there's a lot of problems. So you can say, you can think of all the problems you might have with visual icons, and then it's a lot harder with haptic icons. You have those problems, but they're harder because actually this is mostly a factor of display technology. The display technology is not nearly at the richness that visual technology is. And so imagine if all you had to design with was like a, 
you know, maybe a two bit or a four bit, you know, grayscale display, and it was only, you know, really tiny. How, how, how well would graphic icons work in that case? That's kind of the, the, the comparison set we have right now. So making larger sets, if you want to have more than just two or three of these things, how do you make them distinguishable? What's the design space? What's the perceptual space for that? How do you make them so people can memorize them, so remember them? And, uh, and then there's the whole intrusive factor. How, how salient are they? And do you want to be able to manage salience on these things? So this were some, some defining research questions. And so there's just the kind of the application, the, the cell phone or smartphone is the most obvious application. Uh, certainly back in 2003, before we had smartphones, and it was all about um, kind of a pager buzzer. Uh, how could you make that pager buzzer work a whole lot better? So I'll give you an example that we started on this probably around 2002, 2003. And so here's, here's a problem. Here's a use case. You have individuals. They're not co-located. Like you got your people in Seattle and you got your people up here at the Burnaby campus, cam campus. You're trying to collaborate. By the way, this problem is not dated at all. It hasn't gotten any better than the problem statement was 10 years ago, which is really sad. Uh, and and they, want, they, need, they need to collaborate. They're sharing a screen. They're talking. They have a voice link, but you don't want to use fill that voice link up with little beeps and buzzes. And they need to take turns, OK? Who's been on a video conference or a teleconference, and this got confusing? Yeah. And it might have gotten really confusing. And in some cases, it might have actually in interfered with the quality of what you were trying to do, sometimes quite seriously. I have gotten so frustrated by this, I've just tuned out completely and stopped even trying to say anything because I couldn't, um, couldn't work it in. And how much worse does it get if there's someone who's being really dominant? OK? You can't break in when someone's dominating because you have no way to use the verbal, the, the nonverbal language to say, come on, you know, and sort of, you know, I'm going to talk. You can't do that if they can't see you. So can we give another channel? Can we use touch? It's not the natural channel in this case. Whatever we use touch for, we don't usually use it for turn taking in a collaborative setting. So, so we're trying to do some kind of a remap here. OK, Apple software is not really set up for this. And even though Skype is great, and my Kogo and all these, you know, Gmail, whatever, Gchat, they're, they're, they're getting better, but they're still not any even close to solving this problem. And nor, might I say, is all the hot stuff, research things they're doing at the, the collaboration conferences. It also is not solving this problem very well. So multiple users use a single user app. You need a protocol. And we want to support urgency. We want to replace those nonverbals that we've lost. OK, so can you use haptics for this? to reduce load on visual auditory systems because you're using those channels for something else and they're already challenged. And can haptics, at a glance, display simple data, like urgency? And so we used a haptic mouse. And this was Andrew Chan and my colleague, uh, Joanna McGrinnery at UBC, who worked on this. User state confirmation request urgency. That's, what we, that's all we were trying to get through this signal. So these are the haptic icons we used. There's a mouse. We modified a standard mouse using the cheapest possible technology because we wanted the, this use case to be a you know off the shelf kind of potential potential scenario. Two tone buzzes. So this is a time series. Each of these is two seconds long, and so you can. This is kind of the vibration intensity for the cheapest kind of tactors. All you have is one thing you can vary, and it's basically how fast it rotates around. But it, it uh, corresponds to both frequency and intensity, so that's what you got. So dun, 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 dun. Only you don't hear it, you feel it. Okay? And then that's if there's a change in control, change is transferred. Okay, in control, that means I have control. Okay? And so this is what I hear. This is what I feel, rather. This is no one's in the queue, this is one person's in the queue not urgently. Whenever you get a chance, I'd like a turn. And this is, there's either someone urgently wanting a turn or there's multiple people in the queue. So this is telling the dominant person, time to shut up and get off the line. If someone else wants to talk. OK, and this is the only one we designed to actually be a bit unpleasant. OK, it's supposed to be intrusive. It's supposed to sort of get in your face. All right, and then waiting for control means I am in the queue. And so I feel nothing in this case. And in this case, I feel either a very gentle tap and in this case, a double tap. OK, and what we, the reason we have this is that if you are inflicting this on someone, you should be getting some feedback back to you, OK? Because you might forget. <laughs> that would be really rude. <laughs> so, and you can also you know, get yourself off the queue or add on to the queue. Let's not worry about that right now. OK, so you have all these things. And, and this is what someone who is in control or um, 
either gaining or losing control would feel. So, the, the, and this actually was a tremendous amount of design. We didn't just think these up and try them out. There was this huge iterative process trying to balance the salience and make sure that people were clear on them. We could learn them really fast. So we did all of that. And then we did this great big study where we gave people a collaborative task, four people collaborating. They were in the same room, but we pretended they weren't. They couldn't see or hear each other. They were wearing headphones sound blocking headphones and uh, they, they had big partitions between them and they're doing a furniture and they knew each other okay so they did have some grounds for interacting performed a furniture layout task where they basically each person had a different set of constraints so you couldn't solve the problem without all of them okay and then you did this task and we did as this is probably I've run a lot of experiments and this is still I think one of the most labor intensive per data point that I have ever run <laughs> Because you have four people in huge, just put three hours of video to get one, basically one data point per observation. And uh, so we ran, I think, four teams on this. So we had a perceptually optimized multidimensional scaling method uh, for a set of seven haptic icons with seven targets. You, so you saw this set of things, a distributed collaborative task and an observational user study. We didn't run enough to actually get good stats on it. And we had a visual turn-taking protocol, a haptic one, and then doing both together. And we actually learned that people, first of all, people could learn the associations really accurately in a very short amount of time. And it actually did change their behavior. Okay, people were, if you looked at the stats of how people, you know, the evenness of the turn-taking and whether you had dominant behavior versus uh, more equitable, it actually was, there was a significant change. Uh, statistically significant change and people rated their ability to communicate urgency was much higher and they actually did use the urgency communicating facility of it so that was kind of cool and then we go on from and that was the first time even even now I don't think it although haptic icons have become a popular topic since then I don't think there have been very many situated tests like that so we thought well that's cool there's what seven seven icons what if, how, how many people could actually learn? Because I would get asked this all the time. So how many people do you think, how many icons can people learn? And I thought, I don't know, 20 maybe? It seems like it would be kind of hard. But we didn't really know what the limits were. So I had a grad student say, let's make a really big set of haptic icons and just see how far people can get. Because we know, what we knew for a start was that probably limit, if you run a short study, people, it's just whatever you can learn in one session. And meanwhile, for visual interfaces, we've been learning them all our life. It's not fair. But I was tired of making the excuse, it's not fair. So instead, we said, we'll train them up and see how far they can get. So we did a longitudinal study. We made a large set using a, a very expressive display. It was a, a, a prototype. My collaborators at Nokia actually built us a smartphone tablet, a rather earlier one, that had a touch screen that actually could vibrate in very controllable ways. So we could make a large set. We made 84 stimuli that were rhythm-based. Rhythm and we asked, and, 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 and we did some scenarios, which were, again, about communicating information through a cell phone, and trained a bunch of grad students up on it over a period of about a month to see how far they could get. So they did, the, the protocol was to do alternating um, training using a uh, training basically learning the icons and then playing a game an immersive game where they would get interrupted with signals and they would have to correctly identify the signals periodically and so uh, and then we would test and see if they could actually correctly recognize those and we studied how long they could do that so and there were some other other things along the way so I had several students who kind of worked on this project at different points and just in the interest of speed was that me I thought I turned it off Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll just jump to the interesting one for the longitudinal study was how many people could learn in a four-week period and so this is a, a glimpse of what it looked like so this was the immersive game they basically had to play um, Tetris and which I guess you can get pretty immersed in I'm not a games person but that's what I'm told and, uh, and, and then you'd have to be, uh, you'd, you'd get interrupted with an icon which you've learned and, a mess and it would be a message something like this and you would have to pick which icon it was. And the way we did this is you started by learning seven, which magical number seven is very easy to learn seven. And then we, after they'd learned those and showed mastery, then we would give them another seven and they'd be tested on 14 and then we'd train them up on another seven and we tested on 21. And we kept building up and it just kept getting harder. And so this is what the results like. And I thought this was one of the coolest plots I've ever seen in my research career. So here's the first seven. So this is the number of sessions it takes them to learn it. And this is the batch. A batch has seven icons in it. Okay, so first seven, it takes you so long. Second batch, 
it takes you a lot longer because you're learning more. You expect it to be harder, but this is the cool thing. It's flat after that. It drops down, it's easier than it was the first time, and it stays that way, all the way up as far as we, we measured them. People started dropping out of the study at this point. Uh, sorry, sorry, people, no one dropped out of the study, but people learned at different rates. So at some point, we're talking, these we have to take with a grain of salt because there's uh, not the full set of subjects are in them, and the ones who are in them are the more skilled, the, the ones who had more aptitude of it. But everyone is in these first three. Okay, and so you can take this very seriously. And the skilled ones did show this very flat learning curve as they, as they went out. So any, any theories, all you cognitive science people, what do you think is going on there? <laughs> any, any, any suppositions? Batches have seven. Sorry? I think that's exactly what's happening. It's your one's language, right? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's great. It's great that you're saying that. Um, so that, that was, I'm not a linguist, but that's my impression of what's happening, is that anyone can learn seven things of, of whatever. You know, that's your limit of working memory. It's a, it's a comfortable number. Our, our, our brains are, can, can handle that pretty well. When you ask someone to juggle 14 things, that's not so easy. And suddenly, they can't just use brute force mechanisms for that. They actually have to form some kind of a cognitive structure to hang those objects on. Once they have done that, that's a lot of work. Once they have done that, they can keep adding stuff into that structure. And so I think that that is very much like learning other kinds of language. And at some point, I think what we're limited by here is not people's ability to learn. I think this pattern suggests that the limitation is not people's ability to learn, it's the richness of the display. And our display is not very rich. So we do hit a limit. There's basically some perceptibility problems that it's hard to tell things apart. They, the, um, learning English words is harder when the words are very subtly different from each other, right? The narrower the distinctions are, the harder it is to learn. Visual icons, graphical icons that look quite a, a har a similar are harder to learn and remember. But um, and there's some, a lot of other really cool kind of cognitive questions that have come out of this research. For example, I have a theory which is proving harder to test than I hoped it would be, uh, that, that if you have language to describe, words to describe what you're feeling, that you can vastly expand your library, your, your dictionary of things you can touch, versus if you're just trying to feel them. You need to be able to name them. I think it will make a difference, but I haven't proved this because it's actually really hard to design the experiments that will test this theory. Anyway, so this is a cool, this is a cool plot. But then I thought, you know, you can, you can do this, but actually it was uh, it, it did take, um, you know, paying people $10 an hour to stick with it and learn the icons for that much. And I think that until our technology gets better, this is not going to be prime time. Okay, it's, they're still too hard to learn given the technology that we have. Once the technology is more expressive, then people will be glad to do this on their own. So, s step back from that and let's get back to the technology. So I will, but I just had one more thing. So this conference we're doing in Vancouver in March, which I encourage you guys all to come to, we are going to actually be using haptic icons in the conference sessions on the speaker to tell the speaker when their time is up. And so anyone who's ever moderated a speaker, so right now Shamina could be buzzing me and saying, Karen, you're dropping a little bit behind time. So, so when, when you're actually trying to control timing quite precisely, like 10 or 12 minute talks, and anyone who's moderated a conference and you're like waving the little sheet of paper saying, two minutes to go, look at me, look at me, tell me you've looked at me, and it's really frustrating. So we're designing a new, this came up at the last Haptics conference, and I thought, you know, we can, we can do better than this. And so we're actually gonna run an experiment in the conference where speakers are actually wearing our hardware and being, being buzzed if they have signed the consent form and agreed to it. Um, and getting this by ethics is something we're working on right now. <laughs> I, I hope they don't give us trouble about it. So, so that's, uh, yes, and I have uh, tremendous exposure on this one. <laughs> I hope it doesn't fail badly. So, uh, so let's talk about the technology, though. So this is as being frustrated by the quality of the technology. I, in a computer science department, I don't really have the right resources to do lots of technological development, but I have 
partnered with people who are brilliant designers and then worked with them on developing the application design. So here's one example. We did around 2005, I think. So this was done in partnership with Vincent Hayward at McGill and his wonderful graduate student, Jerome Pascaro, who's now at RIM, and uh, my graduate student, Joseph Look. And so basically the technology Vincent had always already worked out, but he had this great huge braille display for the blinds. It was really this huge desktop massive behemoth. And I told Vincent, I want, let's make this in a handheld format. And he says, this can't be done. So six months later, here it is. And uh, his graduate students were not quite as um, cautious as he was. This is Jerome and Joe. Jerome is the main uh, mechanical designer on this one. And so the idea here is you have little piezo strips and they spread apart from each other, which is an unusual configuration, but it works really well. And then it uh, uses a phenomenon called skin stretch, stretches your skin, and it feels very much like you're being pressed its indentation. You can't really tell the difference because your skin is having the same kind of stretch being applied to it. So, and it turns out this is a really efficient way to use piezos. It doesn't use much power and it's relatively compact compared to other things, other ways you could try and configure piezos. So, I, um, did I finally get a, a video to work on this? Yes, so this is just kind of a look at what it does. You can see that um, this is hooked up to, so here we go, not just technology, but actually interaction design. Uh, so Joe, my student, did the interaction design on this, and he's linked it up. So actually, normally this would be sliding up and down on a slider here, and that would, put, would be controlling you, your passage through the menu. But what you feel as you go over them is you, you, this is just one of the many applications we prototyped. Uh, you can actually feel the, the, the bumps of the links as you go over them. And so this was a really interesting project because the skin stretch thing, you've never felt it before. Okay, It's a new sensation. It's weird. It's really nice, but it's weird. What it would really feel like is you took a comb and you stuck your comb against your finger and you run a pin over the comb and you kind of feel the tines spreading apart. It's not a really strong sensation, but it's nice. Unlike your buzzing things, you could sit here and hold this, I often have, and just play with it and twiddle with, fiddle with it, and it feels really nice. Okay, you could keep on doing that. But we had to perceptually categorize it because it was a new sensation. It's like, you know, you'd always had black and white and now you have color, but we don't have any color theory. We didn't really know what would be salient or what would be distinguishable or what would convey a sense of motion or direction, none of that stuff. We didn't know that. So we had to do a whole bunch of uh, percep perception experiments and then combine that with scenario design. And that was uh, a really cool project and it got a best, best paper award at CHI, so I guess other people thought it was cool too. And that was a winning combination, so we did it again. And this is my postdoc, uh, uh, Vincent Levesque, who also came out of Vincent Hayward's lab. And, uh, but we, in this case, uh, so this is another project we did more recently, and this was actually in CHI in Vancouver just this last spring, and also got a best paper award. So, so the idea here was that we paired with uh, Ed Colgate at Northwestern, and I, oh good, his name is up there too. Uh, so they invented the technology, we did nothing on the technology. And what it is, it's a variable friction display. So you have a sheet of glass, or a sheet of anything really, and you vibrate it with the piezos, and when you vibrate it fast enough, it creates a little squeeze film of air, and it lowers the friction, the coefficient of friction. So by controlling the vibration, you can make it have low friction or high friction or something in between. Okay, and so Colgate's group developed this. They first demonstrated it in 2007. There's now several other groups who have co uh, in parallel invented uh, related technologies that do different versions of the same thing. But we had a head start. And so Ed, who's a, a dear friend of mine, said, um, I said, wow, that's sort of the neatest, neatest demo I've seen for years. This feels great. And he says, yeah, it's really cool, but our demos suck, and I don't know what to do with it. It seems like it ought to be good for something, but I don't really know what to do with it. So it's a classic engineering thing, you know? Great technology, don't know what to do with it. So I said, well, give it to me. <laughs> so he gave it to me. And well, actually, he gave it to Vincent. Vincent did all this work. And, and so uh, what, what Vincent did was he took this basic idea, and so the, oh, this is just a little demonstration of kind of what it does. So this is the how I'm showing it to you since you can't feel it. Um, low friction and high friction on the black and white squares. And this is basically showing as he moves, the finger moves over it, you can see where the friction is low and high. This is just toggling between two levels. We figured we could get four distinguishable levels of friction out of this with the current technology. Okay, so 
we took two-pronged approach, very much like for the other one. Said, well, we can, we can uh, characterize this perceptually. What do you do if you can vary friction? What does it mean to vary friction in an interface? But also, we don't think that that's really going to result in a huge performance improvement. There's been a long history of people trying to show that you can do this and that with a GUI, with haptic feedback in a GUI, and you could make performance better, you could do pointing tasks better, you can do your FITSAW tasks, you could find stuff faster, and it never makes much of a difference. Performance, the pr people are already pretty fast at this stuff, and it doesn't really help. It's a very tiny increment. So they say, what we want to show with the psychophysics is that it doesn't make it worse. Okay, because a classic problem, when you put haptic feedback into a GUI, for example, to highlight edges of things or possible targets so they're easier to find. Does anyone see where I'm going with this? What's going to happen? If you don't actually know where they're going, you have to put haptic feedback on a lot of stuff, and chances are people are going to have to bump over that to get to where they are going, and it will actually slow them down. And this is the conundrum that GUI haptics, putting haptics in a GUI has found for people. And if you do actually know where they're trying to go, why are they dragging the mouse over there anyway? You know, the system could just go there. It doesn't need to do this. So first thing was it must do no harm. We must show that if you add variable friction into a GUI, it won't make it worse. It won't slow you down. If it made you faster, that would be great, but we're not holding our breaths. And then, so, so we had a quantitative pr research prong was we introduced targeting distractors to simulate the situation where uh, it's getting in the way, and you find a small performance. We did find a small performance speed up, and that was good. It was good that it wasn't bad, but not, not enough. This is not going to convince people that they should put variable, that, that, that have the expense and the design change of putting this stuff into a device. So then, we can do this now because people are starting to understand that actually having nice interfaces is nice and people actually pay money for that. Uh, we would go after delight. Now, how do you do that? So we had some, some good hard science for the people who want a controlled study and some statistics. And then we also said, well, what we really want is to show that if you have this in here, it's just much nicer to do stuff. It, it feels better. You have a greater sense of control and you enjoy doing that. And we would like to find a way to sort of Maybe not quantify it, but, but observe it, study it, see, see, see which of our ideas tend to do best on that factor. And so here's a targeting task for those of you who are into this kind of thing. Um, so this is where you're doing a Fitz Law task and you're basically having the, the feedback go up. That's a kind of a slow one. And then we do a faster one. Let me stop that one. Is this one actually going to go? Here's one where there's some distractors. So you can see that they have to kind of go over these other bumps to get to the target, and the number of bumps varies. And we found that that wasn't any slower than if you don't have distractors, right? But still pretty slow. And then, but we did this, of course, at all different speeds. And then here's uh, one where they're going faster. I think that's what this one is. Yeah, so actually seeing you know, how the targeting changes when you go fast. So that's just a sample of the kind of uh, tests we did there. OK, that's enough beeping. Okay, and then, but, but the applications that we did, so this is the fun part, <laughs> the part you would actually remember this for. So, so four different applications kind of made it to the first cut. We tried a lot of things, and these are the things that seem to work best. So this is one uh, everyone probably recognizes the, this is from Apple. <laughs> Vincent uses an iPhone, so everything was um, Apple-centric here. But so basically, this is, this is a uh, setting the time, and so it's a, it's a scroll bar. And the idea is, can you find the right place on the scroll bar better if you can feel a little detense if you're going over as, as you're setting things. So there you go. You can see that where, where the, where the um, pulses are buzzing, every time you go over an item on the scroll bar, and we've tried all different combinations of anchors, and some bumps are big and some are smaller. But anyway, so that was a very popular one. And this is a, a one where you're trying to um, move, do, do other kinds of targeting. So you're trying to move stuff into file containers. And you can see where the distractor work comes in hand here, because every folder you go over, you can feel something. But when you go into the trash can, it goes crazy. So it's sort of telling you, oh, are you sure you want to do that? OK, but, but the targeting of just kind of some subtle, subtle sense that there's something underneath me. And then um, this is one. This one is kind of cool, because look, they just depressed, depressed a spring. So we got a variable friction to actually feel like you're compressing a spring just because even though there's absolutely no compliance in the system by actually having a force as a function of how far you are going reinforced by what you're seeing and then so this is just a game we tried not to indulge in too many games because they're kind of easy targets 
This is my personal favorite because it's the only one that was actually my idea. So, so um, it's like bubble wrap. Okay, when you're when you're sliding the words around, you kind of feel a little poof, 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 and 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 it actually makes it a little bit easier to to move the words through the through the um, other text if you're trying to do some text editing. So I will tell you a very notable one that we really, really wanted to get to work, and this technology does not work for it, is making your keyboard work better. So, so you could actually feel, I know, it's so frustrating. It was a holy grail to make it so you can actually type better, one-fingered whatever. But the problem, so this is kind of interesting, this particular technology, think about it. It vibrates, it, okay, the friction changes, the, whole, the friction on the whole screen changes. It's always the same on the whole screen. So it changes over time, but in space, it's always the same. Okay, so if I'm high friction under my finger, I'm high friction everywhere. If I'm low friction, I'm low friction everywhere. So you can't feel edges, okay? So if you're sliding over something, you can feel it go from high to low, and you can feel that transition, but you can't have your finger just kind of resting on the edge of something and feeling, or, or be guided along a path because you're kind of riding a curve. You can't do that with this technology. If anyone can think of a technology that you can, tell me about it, because I want that. Okay, so this was a really fun experiment, and uh, Ed Colgate is taking these results and going back and trying to commercialize it, so we'll see how it comes along. How am I doing on time? I wind it up? Okay, so I'll go quickly through some of the emotional design work. And uh, so, backing up, oops, just lost my, cursor here. So emotional design, uh, when you're surrounded by beautiful things or attractive things or outdoors kinds of things, people tend to be healthier, heal faster, all lots of evidence, which I will skim over right now. And uh, people have been, for 10 years at least, been studying this in the context of HCI and design, but no one was really coming at it from the standpoint of touch. And there's some really um, interesting, provocative stories, mostly kind of anecdotal, some of it in, in studies, which are to the effect of, uh, like, there was one study that says if you are sick, you have cancer, you're, you're, you might be treated with different techniques, have different medication, have been different levels of sick to begin with, what's the highest prognosis of your outcome is, do you have a cat? Okay, and there's other stories like that. You think, what's with the cat? What is it about the cat that is such a profound difference? And of course, there's all the stuff about young, uh, when, when you're an infant or a young child, if you're deprived of touch, you know, how much that messes you up. This touch thing is very important, especially at formative years and when you're ill and when you're old. That's when it shows up the most. But that might just be when, you know, people need the most extra help. It's probably helpful all the time. So we went on this long odyssey to try and understand what's with a cat. Okay, what do people like to tuck, touch? Can you design everyday interactions that feel good, like delight, like the study I just showed you where we're really going after that factor? But also, how do people communicate emotion haptically, how important it is to them, how do they read it from others, and how do we reproduce it? Can you change people's emotion through, let's say, a robot? Okay, so um, I'll skip over the affect grid stuff and just say, so this is some tools we've been using, uh, biometric sensors for some of our work. Uh, where basically, let's just take on assumption, it's a very big assumption, but we're hoping it will soon be true, that uh, you, you can measure the valence and arousal of your emotional state to quite a good degree in real time with the right models and with the right controls, we can do that right now, and determine if right now you are anxious or angry or happy or sad. And where we are right now on that is that we can get valence pretty well, sorry, we can get arousal pretty well, but valence is harder with the measures that we're using, and we're still working on that. But so, um, and then we started exploring cats, okay, or small creatures. So the idea is you build a synthetic robot that senses human touch. It can move, it can be expressive in similar ways that a, a lap pet might, and use that as a platform to study emotional touch. So this is the version we have right now. We've been through a lot of iterations on this guy. My student calls him the haptic creature, and I call him the furball. He's about this big. He weighs about, I keep calling him he, but I shouldn't do that. Uh, the size of a big heavy cat. He has a lot of hardware inside and a lot of touch sensors on the outside, which actually don't work well enough and we're doing a major re revision on that right now. And so the idea here is that it can act like 
an expressive animal. It can breathe and purr and do all these things, and it does it pretty well in a very organic way. It makes too much noise right now. We're working on that. And also, we have pretty good touch sensing on it, and it's getting better with a new, new revision on it. So if you have that, what can you do? OK, so this is the model. This is Steve Johannan is my PhD student. He's writing up his thesis right now. And he's uh, been here for quite a while. So you have, here's the person, low level sensing, gesture recognizer, OK? So, so all those force sensing resistors and all the other kind of sensors we're putting on it. Uh, an emotion model, this is kind of the plug and play, decide what kind of personality this thing is going to have. Is it twitchy or is it really calm and sleepy? You know, you could tune that here. Render and display some kind of outcome to it. So Steve's PhD research has been very much about understanding what should be inside this guy. Okay, and also what kind of gestures we should be able to recognize because what kind of gestures do people use and what will they mean? Okay, and then in other words, what kind of emotion might be expressed by those gestures? And also, uh, what, how do people interpret the different ways this thing can move? So he did a series of studies. First one is how do people interpret the emotion display? How do they display emotions to it? And do people's emotions move when the loop is closed? In other words, when they're doing this in real time, okay, I'm touching it, I'm displaying some kind of emotion to it, and it's reacting in a variety of ways, can we actually change people's mood by the way it reacts to you in response to particular touches? The answer is yes. And um, we're writing this up for publication right now. And uh, this is for essentially, well, let me just show you. Very briefly, this is the affect grid valence and arousal. These are kind of some places on that affect grid, different kinds of emotions, and these are emotion words that might go in those places. And the way we did these studies used a lot of emotion words and asking people to express them or to use them to interpret things. And so here's a touch dictionary. You're not supposed to read this. But it's an idea of a whole bunch of gestures that people might use to touch the cat and how we define them. We did this big video analysis of how people actually did this. And as a result of this, we feed this into our gesture recognition algorithm, which we uh, postdoc is now working on, to uh, be able to actually interpret these using sensors as opposed to video analysis. OK? And then this is an example of what that study might look like. So if told to interact as a feeling dis distress, and it's like I, I, I put the creature in your lap, I tell you, you're distressed right now. So it's a fake emotion you have to simulate. That's a, a problem with all these studies. OK? And then what gesture might you use? And this is the frequency with which you might use these different gestures. These are high, high frequency gestures. So that gives you a sense of how, how we actually did these rather, rather difficult studies. And can we change people's emotions using just touch? And what I'm going to do right here is just tell you really briefly about an application of this study. So Steve's work is very successful in that we, we got a yes for all our questions. How, how often does that happen? And, uh, but it did take a long time. We have this great platform. And what happened almost immediately is when people would come through the lab and they would see this platform, they'd say, wouldn't it be great if you used that for such and such? So we'd say, yeah, that sounds really cool. And one of the ones that was very exciting to us was, um, wouldn't it be neat if you could use this to actually help kids who are really anxious and help them to calm down? Because we can actually sense their anxiety level, and we can use it to um, help train them how to you know, make the creature do something by, by how it's sensing their emotions. So if the creature acts a particular way when I'm really anxious, I'm trying to get the creature into a different state. And if that happens, that will mean that I'm less anxious. It's a way of visualizing my emotional state, more engaging in a background way, which theoretically would work better than the methods they have for, for kids to do this now. And forget about kids, I want one of these for me. So, so, uh, so that was started the project. It turned out it was really, really hard to work with kids. So we're seeing a lot of anecdotal evidence that this works great, but having a hard time experimentally to show it. And so we've been doing that, but the latest pass on is we're actually uh, gearing up for a big study to take this into BC Children's Hospital for children who are about to undergo anesthesia and surgery, which is a very, very anxiety provoking state, especially if it's uh, repeat surgery. You've been here before and you know it's unpleasant and you're very scared and the family is tense and scared. We're going to use that situation where the kids are really stressed out. So we don't have to stress them out. This was an ethical concern with our other studies this is actually having to stress the kids out. Here, that, that burden is taken off of us. They're already very stressed. And we are just studying how this thing helps them and see the effect on their outcomes. So that's something that we're working on in the next uh, year or two. So. Uh, 
so, and, and our results, uh, because it was difficult to work on this with kids, we've been working on it with adults and actually finding strongly statistical results that if all you do is you put the creature in someone's lap and you make it breathe, they feel better and they calm down. Nothing, no instructions, no breathe with it or anything, but their breathing does slow down and they do have their biometrics and their subjective factors all show strongly significant results. So that's an exciting result that we don't know if it will transfer to kids. We have every reason to think it should, but we haven't uh, demonstrated that yet. So, um, and then just one last, very last thing I have to show you that's really cool is that our touch sensors are not good enough. And for one thing, they can't get the really light brushy things. So we're developing a new sensor, which actually is uh, electronic uh, conductive threads in the fur and you can scratch it and scratch it and it does things and using machine learning techniques on that. So we actually are developing this new sensor, which we will put all over the creature and use that together with the pressure sensors to be able to get um, pretty good uh, sensing all over it. And eventually trying to make a handheld version of this guy. So I will stop there. And uh, sorry for probably going way over, but. No, oh, not at all. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Don't forget to come in March if you want to know more haptics. So, I mean, actually, why don't we take a little bit of time now to ask a few questions, if we have questions for Karen. Um, these last few projects are quite interesting. Questions from the room? Yep. Um, I'm just thinking about the keyboard problem. This is really bugging me from their time. Uh -huh. um, I wonder if the sensors need to be on the uh, on the display. What if they were, if somehow you can detect the position of fingers? Um, I've heard that um, the uh, CIA can actually detect what you're typing by the sound. So that's mm -hmm. just an example of how one can detect remotely uh, wow. what you're doing with your fingers. So if you had some technology that can detect minor motions in the hand, maybe that would be a starting point. Actually, on the hand as opposed to from yeah. the screen. Yeah. Why talking. do we need to be touching anything? We've yeah. Got. Well, gestural interfaces. So, so are you talking about sensing it on your hand while you're touching the interface and then being able to? Uh, no, I'm just talking about moving my gestural. hand. My hand could be. Yeah. So there is there is a lot of work on gestural interfaces. As a as a haptics enthusiast, I actually personally one of the reasons I am a haptics enthusiastic is enthusiast is because I think that um, if you're trying to control things, actually there's lots of evidence for this that uh, some, so you can control some things gesturally, but anything that's really precise, you really need the contact and the resistance. And it's, so uh, the lit if you read the literature in music control, for example, there's lots of gestural interfaces that people have experimented with, and they, they don't work for anything but theremin. Like if you're trying to play the theremin, it's great. But, but for the keyboard, it's 100. So, so for keyboards, so there have been some, a number of chording interfaces that are gestural in nature for, for chording. They're, they're hard to learn, and okay. there's also, um, some really kind of cool interfaces where uh, they're actually acoustic where you can just plug a microphone onto this and I can type on the, any piece of wood or something and the vibrations you can pick up and, and get that. But if you're talking about giving feedback to the hand, okay, so that you can actually feel what you're touching, that is the challenge that I am focusing on right now. So we, we do, not to say that these other things aren't really cool ideas, but I'm focusing on the feedback part. Um, so. Uh, the, the technology I showed you a glimpse of there, it actually does do pr not super precise, but reasonably precise position sensing. There's, there's optical sensors going in from the side so they can tell where you're touching it by occlusion. And it can get multiple fingers from that. The problem we have, the, the limit, is that we can only change the friction on one place in the screen at once. And so we can't do these edges. But if you're trying to do a gestural interface, you might imagine having feedback on your fingers. Okay, so I'm getting vibrations on my fingers, and that's something that people have explored. Um, and you could even imagine typing on here, but if I have tactors on my fingers, I'm wearing a glove or something that has tactors on my fingers, and when I type on the surface, those are going off. So I'm getting the resistance from the surface, but I'm getting a little extra uh, overlay of information through something that's on my fingers. And those are ideas that people have have explored with varying degrees of success. One thing that is becoming very clear is people do not like to wear stuff on their hands. Um, I'm encountering this because we're using the biometric sensors and uh, we do, people are happy to do it for an experiment, but when you ask them, they always say, I'll never, never wear this for real. So we're trying to move away from that. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Let me get a cop. Just as I'm supposed to talk. Oh. <laughs> <coughs> um, uh, on one quick note, I, I noticed because uh, we're working with the the Microsoft Connect, and they have a right. new bunch of commercials out, and the commercials are they actually show. Uh, someone, uh, you know, saying how wonderful the world will be, and they actually do show somebody with an invisible cello and mm -hmm. an, an invisible violin. I, I, and, I don't buy that scenario and, at all. You, I, just, <laughs> I, just, I just laughed out loud when I saw yeah. it, even though I'm literally working on some of that research. Yeah. I, and, you know, that, that, that would be impossible, right? And yeah. in fact, I can't even do it. Um, on what you're doing with Haptec, uh, Haptec, especially from a cognitive idea uh, sense, there are different things going on, right? Mm -hmm. So some of it is just this notion of reality and object, you know, uh -huh. which is, oh, I can, there's an object and I can feel it, or I'm used to feeling things. I'm used to feeling trees, I'm used to feeling yeah. texture, and that's one side. But what you're doing with the, the cat uh, um, work goes way beyond object. You're really now dealing with, with this kind of human to human, human to animal thing, that the, this mm -hmm. breathing. So now you're in, you know, from thinking about it, it's a really, <coughs> from modeling it, and you mentioned that there's a whole emotional model, it really is, in some ways, a very different space. Yeah, oh yes, it's a very, it's, a, it's much more um, going to a different part of people's brains, right. for, for sure. We're going from the perceptual and almost hardwired motor reflex level stuff into, um, well, once you go into emotion, who knows what's going on in there? <laughs> it's, it's a it's a it's a hard to study area. But right, and, uh, and then and then the the first stuff you showed, which was had to do with turn taking and things. Yeah, that's I was thinking that's almost somewhere in between because it's uh, it's it's social social protocol. So you know yeah. you expect things. It's yeah. it's not just oh it feels like what I thought it would feel like. It's actually oh of course yeah. it's coming to me now. Because oh okay. So so I think what you're saying is there's we we call this kind of high fidelity interfaces. You know make can you make it feel like the real world? And that's that's been the the endeavor of a lot of technological development and and application design. And we're definitely saying no no. Um, uh, can you encode stuff in it? Can you make it mean something different? Can you redeploy this in a different way? Can you work it into social protocols? Can you use it to um, you know, replace things that are important to people that they've lost in other parts that when the world technol the technology or you're stuck in a hospital and you can't have this channel anymore. Can we provide it in a different way? And the interesting thing with the creature, we're not the only ones who have tried to study emotion in a robot. Thing, although we've taken it a lot further on the touch and really systematically trying to understand what touch is doing in that interface. But there's one who's heard of uh, Paro, the little white seal. It's gotten a lot of media attention over the years. It's out of Japan. And so it does, it does a little bit of breathing or something and a little bit of touch. And I think if you squeeze its flippers, it barks or something. But, um, but it's actually uh, Shibata's group in Japan. It's, it's really cool because they've taken this thing and they put it into seniors' homes and hospitals and things. And just what we know from that work is that people attach to it. And it's crazy. It's like it's a little seal. It's like who cuddles with seals, right? But they love it. And they, they're, they're, they put something onto it. Just like you say, it's like, like something is going on there that's very profound. And we're trying to catch that and take it further and understand how it's happening. A little, a little bit better, but it's been very inspiring to see that work. Yeah. I have a couple of questions down front here. Thanks very much. It's a really interesting talk. Um, so this is less of a question and more of kind of just want to throw out some idea brainstorming for research ideas. When you're talking about uh, the cancer patients um, and so those who had cats seem to have a better prognosis. Mm -hmm. um, so my worry with that would be that they wouldn't have controlled for who had cats and who didn't. So That's can I actually study. <laughs> say, yeah, so maybe yeah. it was just uh, some um, aspect well, of the cat owners that <laughs> made them special. And yeah, yeah, so, so, so you're saying this, the fact that you're the kind of person that would have a cat, is, yeah. that, is that a factor? Absolutely, great question to answer. So this was more of a provocative study and also, you know, suppose it was really having a cat, not just being the type of person. It's like there's many different things about having a cat that might be implicated here. It might be that, well, you have to take care of yourself because you've got another creature that's depending on you. It might be a similar thing to having a child, you, you know, but there could also be the physical contact. And there's so many evidence from other places also that the actual, just the touching 
is important. You know, how good does it feel to have a hug? You know, there's um, Temple Grandin, the autistic woman who calms down when a mechanical thing hugs her. I don't know if you're familiar with that work. It's absolutely fascinating. There's a wonderful movie about Temple Grandin, who's a very high, extremely high functioning, brilliant aut autistic woman who actually, because of her own uh, own feelings and what works for her is very good at handling livestock and designing systems that calm livestock down because she could relate to how they feel and she's basically saying I need close confinement and to be hugged tightly when I get stressed out and that calms me down and it will work for the cows too and it does and that wouldn't necessarily work for other people other people would think that is weird but they're used to being hugged by people but she can't stand being touched by another person because she's autistic and so it's a really fascinating perspective that she was able to bring to that. But there's something really profound about being touched. And if it works from a, for a robot to hug you, if you are in a position where you can sort of set aside the weirdness of that, because most of us are not used to that, then what would happen? You know? and, and all this thing about you know, social protocols, one of the fascinating things about social protocols is in this day and age, we have a profound <laughs> opportunity to watch how fast social protocols can change. And there are things that I walk around the street and see people doing today that I, that I do myself that I would have thought was completely unthinkable, you know, even three years ago. I will now walk around my neighborhood talking into a little headphone thing. And I used to think that was just like, I would never do that. <laughs> so, so people will, will change what they do as, as the opportunities in the, in the environment changes and they find out that it works for them. So that's also an interesting thing to study. That is really interesting. If I might have uh, just a quick kind of follow-up. Um, so what I was thinking just back to the, the health sciences issue with the, mm -hmm. the cancer patients and whatnot, um, you, it, it seems like you guys would be able to do a controlled study to find out whether sort of cats or the robot cats did actually make a difference in the cancer patients' um, mm -hmm. prognosis. Uh -huh. and, so at least that way you could control who got this this robot cat yes, and who didn't. Yes, we can. And yeah, we um, can. Are, are you planning on doing that at all? Uh, we haven't um, proposed a cancer study exactly, but that's, exa that's exactly what we're doing with the anxious kids going into the hospital. Right. right. Is it if you do if you try to do this with a real animal, you could not control it sufficiently, and also with a ca with an animal that people have at home that is their pet. There's too much variation, and that's wonderful, but you, it makes for a lousy experiment. Okay, so what we're doing, we, we are, um, one, one of the experiments we're trying to get to the point of doing, we have to make the system work better, is to actually send, you know, build duplicates of the thing, send it home with kids, and see if they can learn to um, manage their anxiety through a training program using it. But we can run studies then where we change what the thing does and how often they're using it and how it responds to them, and we can actually control this, which you never could do that with a real animal. And, and this one will have a consistency that the, the real animal does not. It doesn't have a lot of the cool stuff that a real animal has. I, for one, never am not suggesting in any way that this thing or its, its um, future versions will ever be able to trace, replace a real pet. I'm, I'm an animal lover. But, um, but I think there's some really neat things we can do to understand what's going on. And for those situations where having a real animal is not going to work, you know, I think it's really cool that we can actually provide some of those benefits. And it looks like we probably can. Yeah, the controllability yeah. is. And, and, and we can understand how to do that. We can do the design part by having this robot that we can fully control. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. And I was, like, I was thinking before that, well, maybe there, were, there would be a difference between, say, real cats and the robot cat. Of like, maybe real cats would be better, but then this, this, like, if you have the controllability, then that's yeah. even better. Although, I guess it would make it even more yeah. difficult to really, like you yeah. were saying, test between them because then the cat's so variable. But um, yeah. again, very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, again, I don't really have a question, but uh -huh. it was going on sort of on uh, the point about the uh, the cat. I mean, one thing you could do this is there's something inherent in the actual response, the the, the uh, like vibration. Um, and I mean, if you put a vibration, a similar vibration, let's say in a tarantula and mm -hmm. gave it to kids, I don't think they're going to oh, be very. This is they're a not going to be very anxious. Question. So this they have. Sorry. No, go, go ahead, finish, sorry. Yeah, so I'm thinking there's nothing actually in this touch. They can be conditioned, either evolutionary, you know, they, they're, they're responding to a certain type of touch, like the, uh -huh. the prickles on your hand might be something that's... When you feel something soft and nice, it's breathing, you respond in a particular way to it. 
So, so is that what you're saying? That well, you're wondering how much? I'm building, sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so if you, if you put your hand in cold water or something uh -huh. and you know, after it's hot or something like that, you want to move it away because it's painful. But uh -huh. in some cases, it, it it's going to give you some information that's val but like uh -huh. valuable. Um, but that actual, the touch, the actual response you get from whatever it is to your system, um, there's nothing in it in itself that seems to be conveying information. It seems to be conditioned either evolutionary, past, mm -hmm. or you have to condition it with, I guess, you, uh -huh. GU, uh, GUIs or whatever. You have to condition the people to be responding in that way. And it seems with the cats, it seems to be Are you talking about the their cats. emotional response or their kind of immediate, how they move their body in response both, to it? it or seems. both, both. Yeah. So you're saying like if petting, how do we get to the point where petting a cat makes me feel good? You're saying that might be a learned that might be a learned response, not an innate response. And what would happen if you, I'm, I'm trying to sort of uh, do another version of what you're saying to see if I understand. And if you, um, <laughs> I've actually thought of this, I want to build a version of this thing which is a snake or a lizard and see, well, I, I'm, I, I don't know when I'm going to get around to this, but I'm very curious about exactly this question. How different would it be if it's not a cute, cuddly thing, but it's actually a um, something that we don't normally pet, but could you actually play with the dimensional uh, dimensionality of space and understand what's going on there better by putting it in, into a different package like that. Again, something we couldn't do with a real <laughs> with a real animal very well. Right, and different society as well. One that keeps correct yeah. with its pets. Then per, per, you, perhaps, you know, the yeah. Dog that yeah, but, 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 but you know, you have, so we have this, this seal, right, which is not a normal pet, but it does feel like a stuffed, stuffed animal, so, so you have that commonality. But yeah, so I, I think what, part of what you're getting at is how much of this is learned response, and is it happening at a sensory level, is it happening at an emotional level? What I, what I feel is very likely, although this is still somewhat debatable, is that some of the big health benefits that you might see, it, it makes me calm down when it's near me, it makes my cancer recover faster. Those are probably due, and I'm sticking my neck way out here because this is not my expertise, is that um, first you get into a better mood and then health benefits happen, okay? So the question is, can we get people into a more relaxed, pleasant, happy state of mind when they're very tense and there's lots of cortisol floating around and you're sitting in all these bad things and fears and anxieties are happening, That's, that is associated with bad health outcomes whether it's short-term anxiety or long-term cancer recovery or getting cancer in the first place, perhaps. So, um, so we're focusing on the step of can we understand how people get into that better mood and how much, what role does touch play in that? And, you know, the lizard experiment is one that I'm very <laughs> curious about. Yeah. So I, I guess my question was on that move then, is it, it, are you exploiting or are you conditioning to get people happy? Are you um, our, our data, the, the data that I can really wave around with a flag right now is all about exploiting. We haven't worked out a successful paradigm yet for a long-term training program where, where, we, where we could actually get people to learn over time. We're working on that, but it's very hard experimentally to do. Um, what we have found that if you just bring a total stranger in, plop this thing in its lap and see what happens, that's, I don't think that's training or learned response. That's an immediate reaction. And those are the ones where we have significant data on it. Thank you. Thanks very much for your questions. I think I'm outwearing my welcome here. No, no, not at all. Not at all. But, but we're, we just... It's this late. Yeah. It's actually yeah. because of this curiosity yeah. that we're running a little late. Yeah. So I want to thank you very much again you. for this talk today. We'll thank his speech mm -hmm. today. And, um, And welcome you back anytime. Yes, this is and, fun. Uh, great, to let great everyone here program, know and those watching on the video that mm -hmm. you know we plan another series of defining cognitive science every uh, fall and spring, and so keep your eye out for the next series starting in January. And you're all welcome back again. And of course, the topics are widely varied, as that is the nature of cognitive science. So thanks again for coming. Thanks.